Hi and welcome to the first of a few videos about oscillations. We'll begin by describing what an oscillation is. We'll look at some examples and applications of oscillators. Then we'll move on to mathematical descriptions of oscillations without damping, where the motion does not decrease over time. And finally, we'll look at oscillations with damping, where the size of the oscillation decreases over time. To begin though, let's look at the simplest oscillation. So this is a mass connected by a spring to some rigid support, and the mass goes backwards and forwards. And this is something that you're probably intuitively familiar with. But I want to identify here some of the key physics points that come out of this. The first is that this motion is periodic. That is, there is some time after which the motion repeats. And in each of these intervals, the motion is identical. It may change size, but the, the motion has the same uh, pattern in each successive period. It just goes backwards and forwards and the frequency remains constant. The other thing which is important is there are two forms of energy here. There's the kinetic energy of this mass and the potential energy stored in the spring. And the energy is sloshing between these two forms of energy. When the kinetic energy here is maximum, the potential energy here is zero. And when the potential energy in the spring is maximum, the kinetic energy here goes to zero. And this is a common feature of oscillators that you have two forms of energy and you're converting between the two. And the rate of this conversion is to do with the frequency of the oscillation. Let's look now at some examples of oscillators. The first one here is a quartz oscillator. Now this is the timekeeping device that you have in a wristwatch. It's two prongs of quartz, there's an upper one and a lower one, and there's a video made using a stroboscopic camera so we can see the motion of these prongs. The motion has a period of 30.5 microseconds, which is a frequency of 32.768 kilohertz. And it's this periodic motion which is used to keep time in a clock. If instead of wristwatch you're looking at your mobile phone, there's a different kind of oscillator in there, but the principle is the same. You need an oscillator to keep time. It's a really basic application of oscillators is timekeeping. Another oscillation um, is that of the sun. Now the sun has many different frequency oscillations. This is one example of the motion of the sun. It's a sloshing three-dimensional deformation where the big ball of plasma to this is sun goes pointy at one end and then pointy at the other. And this motion has a period of 31 minutes, so it's a very low frequency. And although it's a very complicated three-dimensional deformation, it has a single frequency and the mathematics of this system are kind of the same as a, as a one-dimensional oscillator. A mass on a spring has a single frequency. This also has a single frequency, so we can use a similar equation of motion in the end to describe the two systems, even though we're dealing with a very complicated three-dimensional shape. Through the universe, there are so many different kinds of oscillators. So here's some examples. Mechanical oscillators, we've already thought about masses on springs. We've got swings in the playground, for example. We've seen an oscillation of the sun. The oceans oscillate as the tides move around. Musical instruments are based on oscillations. It's the oscillation of the instrument that gives it its particular sound and pitch. There are electronic oscillators. So for example, a mixture of an inductor, L, and capacitor C gives you an LC circuit, which can oscillate. There are quartz crystal clocks, so this is actually a mechanical oscillation with an electrical component, so it's a mixture of the two really, as um, the example we've seen before where I showed you the quartz tuning fork, that's what this quartz crystal clock is. AC current, so the line voltage oscillates at 50 hertz. There are quantum mechanical oscillators, light and atoms can both be described using equations of oscillation, a harmonic motion. And there are biological oscillations, neurons, circadian rhythms, predator-prey cycles, these are all things that oscillate in biological systems. What about some applications? Well, I've already mentioned timekeeping, so pendulum clocks, quartz clocks, and atomic clocks. As time progressed, we start off with pendulums, move through quartz, now we use atoms to keep time. Each one of these has a successively better timekeeping performance and a higher and higher frequency. In general, the higher the frequency, the better a clock you can build. So pendulum clocks have low frequencies of around a hertz. Quartz oscillators were tens of kilohertz and atomic clocks, well, 
they can have frequencies up to the frequency of light, in fact. RF communication, so if you tune to a radio station, then you set the frequency of an oscillator in your radio. So if you're listening to Triple J in Canberra on 101.5 megahertz, you're, when you tune to that station, you tune an oscillator in your radio to this frequency. Mobile phones use various frequencies. Telstra 4G, for example, uses 700, 900, and 1800 megahertz, and your phone has to have oscillator or oscillators that can tune to these frequencies to use those bands for the phone network. An application, if you're thinking about a really hardcore physics application, I think the best is measuring big G. This is the Newtonian gravitational constant, the constant that gives you the force, the gravitational force between two masses. It's the least known of our fundamental constants, and the history of its measurement is very interesting. So I'll go on a little diversion here describing how big G is measured. So here's one example experiment measuring big G from paper published in 2010. What we have here are two swing pendulums. There's one over here and one over here. There are the, the wires and there are two masses here, one mass here and another mass here. And these masses swing backwards and forwards. The motion that you detect using a laser up here can be affected by the positions of these source masses. There are four source masses. And you move the source masses around and monitor changes in the oscillation of these pendulums. And so this is a was a very good measurement of big G, very low um, errors. Here's another measurement of big G published the year before in 2009. And this uses a torsional pendulum. So there's a mass here that can rotate around. It rotates one direction and then rotates back in the other direction. So it swings clockwise and anticlockwise. There are some masses around the outside here. So these are the source masses you can move around and the position of the small source masses allows you to change the motion of the torsional pendulum and thereby measure big G. So both these measurements rely on mechanical pendulums, very simple pendulums. Here's the history of the measurement of big G from 1982, here's a, a measurement up here, all the way through to uh, this work here which is published in 2014. This red dot here is probably the first measurement that I'm aware of that measured big G without using a mechanical pendulum. It used instead an atom interferometer, so these were atoms falling through a vacuum. But all of these black dots here, they use uh, mechanical pendulums to measure big G. The interesting thing you'll see here is that sometimes the errors are very big, like this one here is quite a big error, and this one here. Oftentimes the errors are very small, and very often these measurements do not agree with each other within their experimental errors. And so this is a very controversial field of measurement of big G, and there's a lot of work to be done, and no one really knows exactly what this constant is, and as I said, it's the least known of our constants. All the mysteries of gravity using simple harmonic oscillation, others are playing on swings. A swing is an example of a simple harmonic oscillator, at least for small angles. Now, it's a very simple setup. You have a rope here with some length L, it swings backwards and forwards. The angle of the swing is given by theta. The displacement from the center here in the horizontal dimension is X. And there's a force due to gravity that we can break up into a component that is tangential to the arc of motion and uh, parallel to the rope here. Now you could solve this equation using the Euler-Lagrange formulation, a totally valid method to do it, but you can also do it using Newton's laws. So I'll just walk through that now. So we find a restoring force as a function of theta. So the restoring force is this component here, which is pulling you back towards the center. So that's mg sine theta. And it's negative because it's in the opposite direction to theta. Then we have an acceleration of the pendulum as a function of theta. So we have a length here and the, the linear acceleration, so not the angular, but the linear acceleration will be this length multiplied by the acceleration of this angle. So the acceleration a is equal to l times theta double dot. And we equate mass times acceleration with the force to get this equation of motion, which is nonlinear. Make the small angle approximation, and we get an equation for theta double dot equal to negative g on l times theta, or if you prefer, you can write it in terms of the displacement x. So this is our equation for simple harmonic motion in the limit that the angle is small. So a swing pendulum, an example of simple harmonic motion, at least for small angles. Now it may not come as a surprise that when grown-ups start playing with swings they can do things that are both dangerous 
and a little bit mean, so I'll leave you with this video of a swing that is very much not in the small angle regime. Maybe somebody else could just go. Two, one, zero! I can't do it. Two, one, zero! I don't even want to jump. Two, one, zero! I don't want to do it. Three, two, one, zero. I don't want to do it. Put the other hand on the rope. No, I don't. Take six inch step to the right. Just start right there on the edge. Just like that. Honey, I don't want to do it. Put the two hands on the rope. You know I love you, right? No, please don't push me off. Please I'm don't. Right. I am not. I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm not going to push you. I'm not going to push you. But if you stand here for more than 10 more seconds, I will. <laughs> Three, two, honey, honey, ah! <laughs>